coming. Welcome. So I am not planning on talking for all that long. I really do want to open it up and have a conversation. And my talk is structured in such a way that I might actually ask for your input at times. And I really want it, right? I'm not just saying it. So just a little bit about me so you know where I'm coming from. Um, I have been here at ARC for 10 years now. It's hard to believe it's been that long, um, but it really has been. Um, I did my PhD at American University in Washington, DC, and my dissertation was about the three waves of the women's movement and their interaction with Congress and the presidency. Um, that was fortunate, I was lucky to get that published. And then I also wrote a book on women in politics from a comparative perspective which was also published and went into three editions, and I have a number of articles. So none of that stuff necessarily matters except to say that, yeah, you know, this is what I love talking about, this is what I love doing research on, this is what sort of floats my boat, right? This is what's really interesting to me. So it's my passion. So I really enjoy talking about it and sharing it. So that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. And then Elena is, uh, approached me a year ago to be, I'm just trying to make sure I get the mouse working here, uh, to advise the Feminist United Club, which I was honored to do. And we were talking about Women's History Month. And while there was a great talk a few weeks ago from some historians, we thought that maybe something a little bit more about current politics might be useful, especially with all the excitement that's been going on um, over the last year. Uh, and so you should see a couple pictures there that should be somewhat familiar to you. Uh, what am I probably, it's my first thing that I'm talking about probably. What, does anybody remember what happened last January 21st, 2017? Elena? The Women's March. The Women's March, yeah. So I wanted to first begin by talking a little bit about the Women's March on DC. So we have, you know, there's obviously a ton of great pictures of that. This is actually what's kind of cool about it is this is a picture of women in, um, in Nairobi uh, protesting. So the Women's March was five million women on seven continents that staged marches. It was the largest coordinated protest in US history, right? So put that in perspective. It was the largest coordinated protest in, in the entire US history larger than any coordinated protest about other civil rights or anything else. So that's kind of a big deal, right? And just wanted to, a couple times, I'll try to take you to some sites so you can see where you can go uh, and find more information, because I'm always about trying to help students uh, you know, engage and get involved and find out where to go. So you have the, the Women's March website, uh, which you can subscribe, and they'll send you information. They obviously have a lot of information about the upcoming elections and the ways that all people, not just women, can get involved, obviously, in this and about um, the, the walkout, whether you staged a walkout and the national, the, there's going to be, obviously, uh, an organized march on March 24th about national gun, about gun issues. So I just sort of wanted to show you that website so you can kind of see, see a little bit. And, one more picture, just because I think this is really compelling, right? This is the National Mall in DC, and it's just a sea, right? There's no space. So this was really a big deal and kind of exciting. The next thing I wanted to think about and then ask you guys a couple questions is, of course, the Me Too movement. 10 years ago, in 2007, Tarana Burke started um, I think my the slide is not, you can't see the, for some reason what I'm seeing there in terms of the title isn't showing up there, but that's okay. It basically says the Me Too. It's the hashtag Me Too at the top of the slide. So 10 years ago, Toronto Burke started the Me Too movement. And again, it has a website so you can go and see what's going on, um, a way to get involved in the movement to support survivors to end sexual violence in the United States. And again, this also went viral and went across the world, though many people don't realize that Tarana Burke started it. Uh, many people think it was Alyssa Milano, um, who very graciously did acknowledge Tarana Burke very soon after she found out that, that Tarana Burke was the woman who really did start this movement about sexual assault. And so she started it as a grassroots effort to reach survivors of sexual assault long before hashtags were common. So there was no way to hashtag uh, the Me Too movement back then. 
And one of the things that I want to focus on and talk about today, of course, is um, the role of women of color uh, in most of these movements and in elections and voting. And women of color have historically been the most feminist of any women involved in these kinds of movements. Um, they've been more likely to be more feminist and more likely to be activist than white women have been. Uh, and that's probably due to uh, other types of oppression, uh, obviously, that women of color face. So as we look at those two movements, I wanted to ask you guys, and here's a, a great article from The Root, uh, that sort of takes you through an understanding of some of the women um, who have fought sexism and racism over the times. So all of this will be available, I guess, in the video. So if you wanted to get any of these, or you could just email me and I'll, I'll, I can send them to you. But it's a great story kind of um, fostering and talking about uh, the various women who've been very, uh, women of color who've been incredibly active uh, in attaining uh, rights for women. So I wanted to ask you guys, why? You can't see it too well. Again, we're having kind of a cutoff problem there. But why? Why do you think women organize? Why these two movements in such a short period of time after what would ar could arguably be decades of fairly quiet activism on women's part? What do you think prompted women to get so involved all of a sudden? What do you think? Anything is correct, right? You're not going to be wrong here. What do you think might have prompted people? Yeah. I think um, with the United States being such a huge part of the international dialogue and okay. the current administration um, constantly undermining women and okay. their right to speak for themselves, I think that causes a sense of urgency um, for women to, to be a part of these movements and get them going at a faster rate. Okay, and because people probably couldn't hear you, I'm going to try to summarize that and please fix it if I didn't get it right. But I, I think um, you know the young woman up here was talking about you know, the size of the U.S., its importance in the world stage, uh, and then the current administration, um, just the things that have been said, right? Which there's no, no other way to frame them. Um, the things that have been said by our current president, uh, as well as a number of laws passed by state legislatures that have sought to limit women's access to reproductive choice. Uh, and things like that. So that so there were things that happened, laws passed, an uh, elected official who seemed to violate uh, a sense of propriety almost and say very sexist, misogynist things about women. And so you think maybe that's kind of what prompted? Okay, anybody else want to jump in? Yes? I think uh, technology advancing makes that information much more accessible than it was before. So easy to find out things and so easy to share it. Right, so easy to hashtag in the Me Too rather than in 2007 when, when Toronto Burke really couldn't reach people all that easily. Anybody else? Anybody else want to jump in? Yes, sir. Yes. So a level of frustration was reached as people thought that we might elect for the first time a female president. And it's not even just that we didn't elect a female president, we elected a misogynist. Right? <laughs> so it, it's not so much that it was, you know, that, that a woman lost as much as who won. Right? So that's an interesting component. I think we wouldn't necessarily have seen this had Kasich been elected or Jeb Bush been elected or uh, Marco Rubio, right? I don't think you would have seen this level of, of, of activism. So one thing that the social sciences can do is help us understand and explain things. So there are a number of theories that have been put forth over the years to explain why social movements emerge and why people participate. One of them uh, is a more, or some of them tend to stick into more psychologically based theories, which so most of you, most of you actually just behaved as social scientists. right? You identified variables that probably caused an event to happen and you could then go do research and write a paper, right? So you're all perfectly capable of doing, you know, legit research, it won't be fake news and it won't be alternative facts, right? So psychologically based theories tend to argue that some kind of strain in society disrupt people's sense of normalcy. And then people like normal, so they want to return to normal 
So you form a movement or you do something to try to bring things back to normal, right? So we could imagine that maybe with the Trump election or you know, the other state laws that were passed, that that's, that strain was exacerbated, right? So that might be one component of it. Then other psychologically based theories look at something called relative deprivation. So in this, what this is often, a good way to look at this, or an easy way to look at this, is say like the women's movement that emerged in the 60s, where you had women during World War II, what did women do? Where were they during World War II for the most part? In the factories. In the factories and working. And then when men came home from the war, what happened to the women? They were demoted or fired. It wasn't even, <laughs> they were said, thank you very much for your service, but bye bye, we don't need you anymore. So women were very frustrated and a lot of those women had gained an education and work experience. And so relative deprivation argues that when one group, in this instance, women with an education and experience, look at another group, men with education and same experience, and they're not having the same outcomes, frustration emerges. Right, so this group feels deprivation relative to an identical kind of group. Right, it's not that the poor look at the rich, it's that two groups that kind of see themselves as similar feel frustrated. So you could also maybe look at that with the Me Too movement and with the Women's March, where again, educated, um, you know, women with jobs, suffering sexual harassment in the workplace. And obviously men suffer sexual harassment in the workplace too. Please don't think we don't acknowledge that but there is just more of it against women. Um, so it, it tends to, to affect them more. So we could look at sort of women feeling that kind of frustration uh, and feeling that it was time to do something about it. So psychological theories get us a long way, but not quite enough, right? Because people are frustrated a lot, right? Do you feel sort of frustrated on a somewhat regular basis about things, maybe a little irritable? Some, yeah, we all do. But do we all protest regularly? No. Nope, we don't, right? So there's got to be something else that gets us off our asses, excuse my language, um, and out to protest. And what a number of sociologists argued was that movements need leaders, money, and supplies. That frustration is always present. There are always people who are irritable. So there's always stuff going on. There's always people who are poor and struggling. I mean, we don't, we're not glad for this, but it's just the reality that there's always problems, but there's not always mobilization. So this helps us understand it's not that women all of a sudden were being sexually harassed. It's not that all of a sudden there was one man who was misogynist and sexist, right? So maybe something emerged like right? leaders, money, supplies, plus frustration, Right, plus this election right, that pushed women over the edge. So you could look to see if that was present. And certainly there were a number of women who'd been trained um, and were ready. They'd been involved in other movements and were ready. So for instance, also with the older women's movement, there were women who'd been super active in the civil rights movement. Right? And they knew what to do. They knew exactly how to start a movement. So we could look for that here. And then finally, political scientists jumped on the bandwagon. And they argued, OK, people are frustrated, and yeah, you need stuff to do anything. But you probably need an opening, right? You probably need some kind of space where people are ready to hear that complaint. Something, you know, the, when a woman should have gotten elected and didn't, and it's not just that a woman didn't get elected, we elected a misogynist. Right? There's some kind of opening in the political space that led to people. So if we want to understand the Me Too movement and the Women's March, we do need to probably look at some of this stuff to understand why, it, why these two things emerged at really the exact same time, right? And that why we go through long periods of time where really not very much seems to happen. Right? It could be that that level of frustration isn't high enough, the resources aren't there, and there's no opening. Right, it's just you're just meeting a wall all the time, and you can't quite find that space to get any allies. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions for me as we go so far? I've got more to do, but I just wanted to take a moment. Does anybody have any questions about that? About the women's movements? Elena. Is 
Yeah, leaders are important in two different ways. One is that unity, that psychological um, bringing people together, right? That person, that person with great personality who just really draws people together, that charismatic individual that you would follow into the fire. But you also need that leader who's the person who can get things done. The idea person and the doer, not always the same person. You all know that in your lives. You know the person with the big ideas for the weekend and they're not ever gonna go anywhere. <laughs> like, yeah, they're talking about doing that, but it's not gonna happen, right? You know that. Whereas you know the person who, they got it all down, they got the list of things to do and it's all gonna happen. So le movements need both of those leaders often. The person that people will follow plus the person who actually gets things done. So yeah, you do need that, right? Very much so. Any other questions? That was a great one. I will come back if you got questions later. I just want to stop and give you a chance to wake up. So we'll talk a little bit about women in elected office now because one thing that the election of Trump did result in is a whole lot of women who want to run for office. We are seeing record, record numbers of women filing to run for office, maybe, you know, which is certainly exciting. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, women in elected office and how to get them there, right? What, what, what are ways to get women into office? And act, does it matter? Do women in elected office actually behave differently than male elected officials? Because if they don't, right, maybe it's a big fuss about nothing. So in 2018, 106 women in Congress, or about 19.8% of the 535 seats. 38 of these women are women of color. The US ranks 100th out of about 193 countries for women in uh, national legislatures. So we're fairly low down there, right? We're not looking too hot in terms of women in Congress. 71 women hold statewide elected executive offices. So that's 22.8% of 312 available positions. So we're talking about governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, secretary of state, treasurer, things like that. So again, about 22.8% of those offices are held by women. 25.3% of state legislators are women and that number has either declined or held steady for a number of years now. Of the 100 largest cities, 20 have women mayors, one of them being Catherine Pugh, the mayor of Baltimore. So those numbers aren't terribly encouraging. Plus, they haven't really gone up in a number of years. So they're not super encouraging numbers, and we are ranked fairly low. Um, and I had, I thought I had the website. I, so I have a website, if you're interested, uh, for women in parliaments. And I guess I, I thought I put it in here and I forgot, but it's, um, it's the Interparliamentary Unions website and they show you every country in the world. What country do you think has the largest percentage of women in it, in its legislature? Anybody know? It is. It's Rwanda. And there's some interesting reasons for that. Um, Rwanda, and we'll talk about that when we come to how to get more women elected, because one of the ways is quotas. And Rwanda does have quotas. Um, but other countries that are out quotas still have way more women than we do. So we'll sort of talk about that and, and what to do. And I, just sort of, I, pictures tell a lot of words. Because first off, we see obviously a lot of women here wearing pants which today seems like, of course, they're wearing pants. But when fir women first kind of came in numbers, in large numbers into the US Congress, they didn't wear pants, right? That was not OK, right? They had to wear a skirt. And, and so it's been sort of an interesting journey. And this was only a couple decades ago um, that it became acceptable for women to wear a pantsuit into Congress. It matters, and I obviously forgot to have these fade in. <laughs> this is what happens when sometimes you're tired and you're a single parent and you're trying to put a talk together. So, what do you all think? Let's, you know, I mean, obviously I've got a few bullet points that you may have already seen, but do you think it matters if we elect women to office? Do you think those low numbers matter? Is that a problem? Elena. It's a problem because of representation. Okay. 
it's a problem because of representation. What else do you guys think? Do you think it matters if we elect women and women of color and women or men of color, right? Do you think it matters if we have a diverse legislature? No? Why not? And it's fine to take that position. I don't want anybody to attack. Everybody be nice, OK? I don't because I feel like they're hiring the most qualified candidates. OK, so just, you know, we want the most qualified people. And I very much appreciate that being said, because we do need to think about all of these things, right? And one of the funny things that got said when a number of women got elected, I believe it was in Tunisia. It was a North African country. They called it the hairdresser parliament. Uh, but none of them had been hairdressers, but all the men assumed that that's what they'd been, right? That they weren't qualified, and so that women running for office wouldn't be qualified. And so, right, they called it the hairdresser parliament. Again, none of them had been hairdressers, and they were all as qualified as the men in the parliament. But it was just sort of funny how the perception from the public was that you want the most qualified people and not necessarily that might not be women. And so that's an excellent you know, again, an excellent position. We obviously want people to be qualified who are in our uh, legislature, our mayors or governors. What else, though, might we want to think about when we're thinking about diversity in elected offices apart from representation? How about, yeah? Uh, I guess, like, the purpose of a republic or a democracy is that you have a certain amount of people that represent a large amount of people that are going to be So you want sort of if there's 12% of African Americans in the national population, about 12% should be African American if women are about, is that kind of what you think? Yeah, so you want sort of maybe those representations. Yes. Um, it also matters because if we only have men uh, wielding legislative power, um, it's just been, it's uh, highlighting the inequality. Sure. Right, and so what, and I'm sorry, I don't know all your names, and I apologize for that, but what, what um, the young woman here was saying is, is, I think, a very important reason for electing people or for having a diverse legislature, whether that's women or men of color or people who are LGBTQ, whatever, in different ages, different backgrounds. I very much am a proponent of diverse, diversity in a legislature, is that people see people who look like them. When people look at a government and they see people who look like them, they feel represented. And I emphasize that word feeling because it's so important actually to any democracy. The vast majority of a democracy support comes just from people feeling connected to that government. When people don't feel connected, they don't vote. When people don't vote, democracies go bye-bye. Right? So just that sense that a government is legitimate if it looks more like the people it represents, is important and we can't forget that. It doesn't mean we elect unqualified people. Nobody's advocating for that, right? But if we've got qualified people, we want a diverse legislature for symbolic reasons. But we also want a diverse legislature at least for a while because it actually results in very real changes. So there's a whole lot of research done on the impact of having women in legislatures in the US, in the States, in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia, like there is so much research on this. It has been so, um, there's been so much done. And it all shows about the same thing. Women introduce more women's issue legislation than men do. And what we mean by women's issue legislation is an unfortunate stereotype, but I, it's what it is. Healthcare, education, things for the elderly, uh, you know, the caring issues, right? Because <laughs> men don't care about those things. Of course they do, right? But the reality is that women introduce more women's issue legislation than men do. We have seen this for decades now. And if a woman's issue bill is introduced by a woman and a man, which sometimes happen in Congress where they'll both introduce basically the same bill, 
the bill that's introduced by the woman has a greater likelihood of passing, statistically significant. So women's issue bills introduced by women have a much better chance of passing than women's issue bills introduced by men. We're not entirely sure why that is, right? And it's good to twist the head because we're not entirely sure. We think it could be a couple things. It could be that the bill introduced by the woman, she has more street cred, right? Like she's lived on welfare. She's been a single mother. She's suffered sexual harassment, right? So that, that people pay attention to a bill that's introduced by someone who maybe can speak to that issue. There's also some evidence that women actually work harder in legislatures than men do. So in Costa Rica, there was a research paper uh, that, again, part of the reason why women were more successful at getting legislation on women's issues passed there than men was because they actually worked longer hours than men did. So there's sort of a tradition in parts of Latin America for the men to go out in the evening after working and carouse a little bit. The women don't do that. The women stay and they work. Um, and so they put in more hours and more hours normally do translate into more success legislatively. Women interrupt witnesses in hearings less than men do. Um, so there's a lot of research on this. And one of my funniest moments teaching was I was actually teaching this topic next door to a great, I loved my, it was a large class. And it was a great group of students. But this one student who always interrupted me, he was a good kid. And he took multiple classes with me. But he always interrupted me, like all the time. And I would call him out on it regularly. I mean, I'm not a shy flower. And I have no qualms just you know, saying it like it is. And the funniest moment is that I literally, as I'm putting this bullet point up on the screen, guess what he does? In mid-speech, he interrupted me. The whole class lost it, right? Like they just, they couldn't hold it together any longer, right? Because they were sick of him, right? I mean, they were just like, uh, this kid's annoying. I use a nice kid. But in any case, it was just an incredibly funny moment while he interrupted me, while I was saying that men interrupt women, you know, witnesses more than women do. And another great sort of story, um, as women have moved up the ranks in Congress, they've been there longer. They've taken over chairmanships or chairwomanships, right, important positions. And so there was an incident, it was a great story on the news maybe a year ago, where there was one of the committees in the House that was led by a woman. And there was a hearing. You know, they, they get a bill and they hold a hearing. Basically, they want to get witnesses to come in, experts who can talk about global warming or whatever topic they're talking about. So they bring in these experts to talk. The experts sit up front. The members of the House on the committee sit there. And they ask them questions. Normally, they let them or are supposed to let them finish answering, right? So that they can get information, decide how to vote on a bill or what to do. But again, the men interrupt more, mostly to sort of grandstand for their own ego, right? Um, and so this one member of Congress was just constantly interrupting the witness. And the committee was chaired by a woman. And a couple times, she tried to tell him to stop interrupting. And he, and he was like not listening to her. And she finally was like, you're going to stop because I'm the chairperson. And I'm in control. And I'm going to kick you out if you don't stop. And he was like, oh. <laughs> Right? Like he sort of, so you know, women are also bringing a different way of doing things to legislatures, where you don't interrupt as much, and you do, right? You know, be a little bit more respectful. So women are more consensus-oriented than men are. This could be because of socialization. We don't entirely know. Um, for a political scientist, that's not the concern. The sort of why we just want to know what is the result of having women there. And women are more consensus oriented, meaning that they are more likely to try to compromise and work things out and be a little bit more tolerant of others' views, at least have tolerance and discuss. Women are more likely to work across party lines. So we have down here the Women's Caucus, uh, which is a bipartisan group of women who regularly meet to talk about issues that impact women in politics. Um, so they are a fairly friendly group. And one of the funnest, more recent um, findings by a political scientist, I believe, at University of Chicago and one at Stanford, was that districts represented by a female legislator get more money brought home to them than districts represented by a male legislator. And we know that it's the sex because we are able, in statistical analysis, to hold other variables constant. So we know it's not 
other things. It's not seniority, it's not party, it's not anything else. We know that it's gender or sex that matters. So there are some kind of fun, uh, fun findings there that, that mean that it's really different when you elect women. And again, we get these same findings in other countries. So I'm almost done. I just have kind of a couple last slides to talk about the fact that since it does matter that we have women in office, and I want to make a quick comment about uh, women of color and men of color, because I'm speaking also to diversity. We don't, ha unfortunately, we don't have enough data uh, at the national level to do statistically reliable research on the impact of men of color or women of color alone in um, a legislature. Anecdotally, it obviously appears to matter. I mean, it seems to matter as we look at stories or maybe an individual bill and somebody working on it, or if we think about the symbolic importance of children and other people looking at a legislature and seeing people who look like them. But we aren't able to sort of say with the same assurance that we can because we've got enough women. There's physically enough women there now that we can do research that's statistically valid. Does that make sense? So it's not that I'm not speaking to those issues. I think that they matter. And you know, someday we will hopefully have more people there and can do more research. And there are some state legislatures that have better numbers of minorities. And you could do more research there on these issues. So since women do make a difference, let's just sort of sum things up. We'll go a couple more minutes on my part, and then I'll stop. How do we elect more women? What do you think? How do we get more women into, into office? What do you think are the barriers? What do you think we could do to attract more women or get or elect more women? What do you think? Any ideas? Anything? OK, yes. More women need to run. And that is actually the major answer, right? is that women actually do win when they run. There are some nuances there. When a qualified woman runs against a qualified man in an open seat, unfortunately, that qualified man has a distinct advantage and does statistically uh, appear to win more often than the qualified woman. It appears also that qualified women t tend to run in the sort of better districts, right? the more competitive seats. Um, that seem to be uh, you know, good stepping stones to things. So women are more strategic about running, but largely women don't run. So we need more recruitment. Point blank, we need more recruitment. And the research is very clear on this, that we need party leaders to encourage women to run. We need friends to encourage people to run. Like if you have a friend that you think would be great as a city council member or a, a county supervisor or whatever, encourage them to run. It takes women about seven times. They have to be asked about seven times, six or seven times, before they'll actually run. So when women run, they do win. They just don't tend to run. But again, 2018 may you know, certainly see some, we've certainly seen improvement in women running right, uh, in 2018. So that's kind of cool. Um, but we do, again, need on a more regular basis women being recruited to run. And in particular, we need more conservative women being recruited to run. Please remember, I'm not here talking about Democrats versus Republicans, because I don't actually care. I think it's important that women in general are there, uh, whether they're conservative or liberal. Um, that is my position. Uh, and the Republicans aren't always as good at recruiting women to run. Uh, Newt Gingrich was actually very good at this. This was one of the reasons why the Republicans took back the House in the 90s, was that Newt Gingrich realized that it was really stupid to not recruit female candidates. Because you obviously didn't have it. There are so many qualified people that if you're only looking for qualified men, you're missing a really large pool of qualified people to recruit from. So Newt Gingrich recruited qualified female conservatives to run. And it was one of the first times that we saw an influx of, of women uh, Republicans. But by and large, the Republican Party just isn't as good at recruiting women. So the majority of women who are in these elected offices do tend to be Democrat. Uh, the Democrats tend to be more open about recruiting. Again, I said this in competitive open seats with quality ch challengers, not challenges. Women do lose at higher rates than men. So there are obviously some other barriers, and recruitment won't be enough. But recruitment is important. Proportional representation systems. Does anybody know what a proportional representation system is? So in a proportional representation system, there's a couple ways of doing it. But the simplest way to explain it is that when you went to vote, you'd vote for a party, not a person. 
And the percentage that that party wins in the national vote translates to a percentage of seats. So let's say there's 100 seats in the legislature and the purple party wins 10% of the national vote, it will get 10% of the seats in the legislature. The reason this results in more women is because often parties are more comfortable and women end up being more comfortable running when they're on sort of a list of people. And parties often have rules called zipper rules, which sound exactly like what they sound like, which is that every other person on the list has to be a woman. So it goes man, woman, man, woman, man, woman, right? Up to a certain percentage. And so when you have a proportional representation system, especially with a zipper rule, and I'll talk about quotas, proportional representation systems just right away um, are the, one of the best ways to get more women into elected office. We have what's called single member districts, and they are the worst system for electing women to office. They are the absolute worst system. Quotas. These are controversial. There's two ways you could do quotas. You could just look at these 100 seats and say 20 of them have to be for women, or 30 of them, or 40 of them have to be for women. So parties have to nominate enough people, or you have to have enough of those women running. Um, it's a little, it gets a little complicated, but basically they're like set aside, that, uh, that many seats have to go to women. Obviously these aren't terribly popular in a lot of places. Because while actually, this is where we got the hairdresser parliament comment, uh, comment, they weren't hairdressers and they were as qualified as the men there, but it tends to look like a giveaway, right? I didn't really earn it kind of thing. Um, but a number of countries, including Rwanda, which is the country with the most women in the parliament, it was a quota. Now that, the reason they also adopted the quota was because of the genocide in Rwanda and how many men had been killed. So they actually just needed um, you know, more people running for office. So quotas are a way. The other way you can do quotas that's less frustrating to people is in that party list, the parties decide on their own to adopt a quota. So if they have to have a list of 20 people, they decide that they're gonna have 10 women on that list. That's a much, most people like that way of doing quotas better, right? So quotas and proportional representation combined with recruitment, two best ways to increase women. Wouldn't work in the US, um, at least quotas wouldn't so much. We would have to change our district system. We could get rid of single member districts. It's not in the constitution, it's just a US law, right? We could get rid of single member districts. Instead of California being 53 single member districts, we could divide California up into Oh, let's pretend California is 50 just for ease, 50 House members. We could divide California up into five regions and each region elected 10 people to the House. So you could do proportional representation, but you would have to adopt a law. But it's a little challenging for the US. Oh, here it is. Here's the website I wanted to show you. Also, this is another website. This is, um, if it doesn't open, it shows you though countries that have quotas. And there's a whole lot of countries with quotas. So it's kind of cool to see. I don't know if you could see that at all, but basically only white, only countries that are white don't have quotas, which is the US, a couple here, Greenland and Russia and a few, a few other places. But all of these other countries have some form of quotas to elect women to office, right? So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of impressive. It's a lot of places with quotas sometimes with reserved seats, sometimes with political party quotas. So they're pretty popular, um, and they are a major way for getting more women elected to office. And then a couple final things, I'm gonna stop talking. Term limits, right? You could have term limits where a person can only run so many times and then they've gotta leave. The reason term limits are thought to be helpful is because they can, can create open seats. An open seat meaning there's nobody who has the job. There's no incumbent. And then you can recruit more women. So you gotta combine, if you're gonna do term limits, you've gotta combine it with recruitment. Because if you just have term limits and you don't do recruitment, you just have you know, open seats with men running. <laughs> right? Which does not, and then the other problem with term limits is that if, and this is what we saw in a lot of states, is that they adopted term limits, they got all excited about it, they recruited a bunch of women to run, these women got elected, and then guess what happened to them 12 years later? They were term limited. They had to leave, 
but nobody recruited more women. So we went right back to an all-white male legislature. No minority men, no women. So if you're going to do term limits, you got to be very careful with how you do them. And you cannot assume that they are going to result in more women. You've got to combine them with recruitment, continual recruitment. Plus, finally, I think we got to reform the campaign finance system. And we need to get rid of societal prejudices. People having to raise $2 million every two years to keep a job in Congress is wrong. Point blank. It is wrong. Somebody's trying to do public service, and they have to raise $2 million every two years to keep their job. Women are good at raising money. It's not that they can't. But it is a barrier, and it certainly discourages people from running, both men and women, who are like, yeah, I don't want to do that, thanks. <laughs> I think I'd rather see my family. I'd rather stay ethical. I'd rather write all sorts of things. And I want you guys, if you get a chance, to go Google women in politics cartoons, or Bing, or whatever search engine you like. They are awful. They are awful. There is not a positive one among them. If any of you want a research project for like uh, honors research symposium next year, do an analysis of cartooning about women in politics. They are so anti-woman, right? Elena. I feel like we saw that with um, Palin and. Of course, yeah. Because you have like the super feminine looking and the not so feminine looking. Right. Oh yeah, and those are the two most common images that come up in the cartoons. So I was trying to find like a funny cartoon about Clinton or about somebody, woman, you know, about sexism in running for office. Uh-uh, couldn't find it. I mean, for the most part. So I used this one because here's, you know, let the image softening begin. So in some ways you could argue that it's pro-Clinton, right? She's not going to succumb to societal prejudices and she's going to, you know, go forward. But the whole idea that women have to soften the women have to look like they're going to bake you cookies when they get elected for office, right? Like, no, no, no. <laughs> you know, when Hillary Clinton was first lady, one of the first things that was asked of her was what was her favorite chocolate chip cookie recipe? And she's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't bake cookies, right? I'm a lawyer. <laughs> cookies, right? That's not my thing. So again, we need to probably eradicate some of these societal prejudices against women. Women, and this is partly why women won't run, and you need to ask them six and seven times, because they get treated like shit when they run. Right? They are questioned about their femininity. They're questioned about their devotion to their children. They are asked questions that no man is ever asked when he runs for office. They are critiqued on their clothing. They are critiqued on everything. So anyway, that's kind of where I wanted to end. I did go a little farther, but I did try to ask questions while we were going. What do you want to know? Any questions, thoughts, comments? Oh, come on. Anything. Elena. Somebody who's completely unqualified un compared to a qualified individual if right. she lost. And so regardless of whether you're a Democrat, Republican, right. um, I think it was a good example of how um, even if the woman is qualified, right. she is not picked for the job. Right, that the unqualified man still has a better chance of winning over a qualified woman. And, and that's, I think, a good point. Again, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it was a Kasich or Rubio or you know, any of those other Republicans who gotten elected as president, because they're all eminently qualified uh, to be serving as president. But it is a very interesting, and I, I think it's more that you were just kind of saying that. I don't have an answer for it, except that it's perpetual societal prejudices. Uh, against having a woman as uh, you know your your leader of your country, uh, and that people are still more comfortable, even women are still more comfortable with an unqualified male versus a qualified woman in office. Yeah. Do you think this uh, feminist movement in like five years could affect uh, men in the same way it's affecting women right now, getting jobs, looking at employers, saying, okay, now we have to hire women because there's this uproar. So you think can that affect men? In the long run? So over the 
last sort of three and four decades, uh, more and more women are, there has been a movement since the 70s to, and there's been laws passed that required, you know, that you couldn't be prejudiced when you were hiring, which benefited women and minorities, you know, people of color as well as women. So there are laws in place already that make, you know, discrimination illegal. And this is why largely, you know, women and minorities have made any strides uh, in getting jobs, getting housing, getting credit, all those kinds of things. So there already is a backlash from white men, right, that they don't get jobs because an underqualified woman or person of color is getting it. And you will hear those anecdotal stories. They are only anecdotal. Kind of like, like affirmative action looking at minorities in, in that sense. Right, it's the same thing. I mean, because affirmative action is for women as well, right? It covers gender as well as race. Um, yeah, so I think you're already seeing that backlash. I, th I think let's put this from an economics perspective, which was one of my graduate papers as I looked at um, you know, discrimination as a, an economic problem. Um, basically, discrimination is not a smart move economically. Uh, it's a really bad move for a company because it means that they're not, they're not actually looking at the most qualified people. They're only looking at one small subset of the population, which doesn't mean you're looking at the most qualified people. You're just looking at one group of people. So, you know, one of the problems that happens is that when you increase the number of people you're looking at who are qualified, that does mean, of course, that fewer white men will get jobs, right? And those jobs will go to people who are qualified, but who are of color or female. And that is going to happen. And then I, I think that speaks to other issues in the US economy regarding job creation uh, and the need to, to do things like that that we don't do very well in this country uh, in terms of job creation and, and stuff like that. So did that kind of get your question? Yeah. Any other questions? What do you think is going to happen in 2018? Oh, go ahead, sir. Well, so what's interesting, actually, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I should have put it up. I meant to put it up in my, in my um, impact of women. Women and men vote exactly the same on the economy and security. Women are no different. They are not more peaceful. They are not more likely to prevent war or anything like that. So women and men vote the same on the economy and security. Right? So a woman is just as likely to vote for the Iraq war as a man is. So I guess what's interesting is that I don't think people know that. Right? I, there is this kind of... Um, mistaken perception that if only women ran the world, we'd have no war. <laughs> right? Like, no. So I think, though, that I don't even think it was just the Iraq war with Obama. Again, there was lingering misogyny and, and sexism there as well. Um, what was interesting is was listening to the news coverage of that, and boy, did they not paint her well. Uh, in 2008 either. Uh, and what was, it was funny because going into almost every primary, uh, which they were close, right? The primary elections would be super close, like 52 to 48 or 51 to 49. Like, like we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But they would say, oh, Obama is leading and is likely to win tomorrow. No. Actually, it's a tie because all those polls are plus or minus 3%, if not more. So if you say that someone has 49% of the vote and someone else is 51, you really mean that the person with 51 could get as little as 48, and the person with 49 could get as much as 52. So it's a tie. But they never reported it that way. And I, you know me, I'm like screaming at the radio, like, report, like explain to people what this means. But they never did. They don't listen to me when I yell at the radio. I don't know. It just doesn't work. So yeah, so I, again, I don't, women are as hawkish. It's just that doesn't come across. Yeah, that was a tough vote. Sure, I mean, Again, I think this comes back to what we see in the research is that women are held to a different standard, not just to be hawkish, but like there's almost, 
They're regularly critiqued for doing the exact same thing that men do to move up in the ranks of politics. She followed an insider path. She worked her way up through the ranks, took other kinds of jobs, served her time as first lady, you know, put up with a husband who was problematic in many ways, um, right? Uh, not personally, I don't mean politically. <laughs> right, as we talk about sexual harassment, we have to remember in misogyny that this president isn't the only one. He's just the only one who talks about it out loud, right? Um, so I, she followed the path that most men follow and are successful, but she was critiqued. I think it just speaks to larger issues with getting women elected. Right, that often, especially at higher offices where they're more visible, they are held to standards that men are not held to, right, to, to higher standards. And that's just hard. That gets to this last, that last bullet point of societal prejudices, that people say they'll vote for a woman, and I think they will, but they still expect women to be mom, and then maybe mom isn't supposed to be president, right? talk about this as the fourth wave. So that's a great question. Elena asked if we were looking at what would essentially be fourth wave feminism, like that next wave, the first wave being the women's rights movement in 1848, the next wave being women's suffrage, the third wave being ERA, and now this. I'm hopeful, right, that we are facing a fourth wave of feminism and that these two events won't die out. Right, and that's why it's so great. We've got a Feminist United Club on campus. I want to stop talking because I want you all to say something, not me. Um, and, and you don't have to, but I wanted you all to say hi to everybody. But I am hopeful, right, that, that we are looking at the fourth wave of feminism. But it will require, right, um, some leadership and some people stepping up. You do have your opening. I think the benefit of a Trump is that it has pissed a lot of people off. Right, into activism when they weren't active, and democracy requires activism. Let me let, I would love if anybody from Feminist United wanted to say hi, I would love it, you guys, to say, Elena had wanted people to stand up and say why they were feminists. I do. So, um, I don't mind stand up and face that way. You, could, you gotta face them, though. You gotta stand up. Does this microphone work too? Yeah, we just Excellent. hold it and then okay. okay. Hi, you guys. So um, I'm Elena <coughs> Dana Cochea, and I started Feminists United last semester. So after this semester, it'll be um, one year of Feminists United. We're the first feminist club on campus in 10 years from last I heard. So yeah, really exciting. Um, just some stuff about me. The reason that I became a feminist is because in high school, I played on the boys' football team for three years. I was a wide receiver, and I faced inequality. And so I wanted to dedicate my life to eradicating that. So that's a little bit about me. I'm going to pass the mic. And then we'll swing back around. Oh, it's on. Um, my name is Grilene Bariana, and I'm a fairly new member of Feminist United. Um, I was just really inspired um, by my conversations that I had with Elena and um, the narrative that a lot of women that are seeking higher education um, it is very similar in, in many ways. So um, the reason that I'm a feminist is because I feel like my time is as valuable as my male counterparts, my opinion is as valuable as my male counterparts, and I feel like um, all other prejudices aside, I feel like I can do as an, an equal job, sometimes even a better job um, than people that have um, risen higher than me. And, and hopefully, in the future, we can um, aim to change that. So, um, you know, younger women will see um, themselves represented in, in, in people in parliament or in legislation um, so that they can hope to rise higher um, than even we are today. Hello, my name is Troy Beverly, and I would say that what, make, what makes me a feminist is, I mean, not only the fact that I was raised primarily by, you know, my mother, and I saw the injustices that she had to face, you know, as I was growing up, I would just say that I just solely really believe in uh, justice and equality for all. Uh, my name is Shannon Moore. Um, I'm a feminist because uh, to paraphrase Maya Angelou, um, why wouldn't I be on my own side? Um, 
but also it has to do with um, intersectionality. It's very important to remember that, um, you know, nobody is just a woman. Um, and I also think it's important to, when people say, well, why feminism, why not, um, you know, be egalitarian? Well, it's because to me, it's not just, um, you know, being a woman that has a problem in this society, it's a lot of, you know, feminine aspects. Um, men are not allowed to be feminine or what's perceived to be feminine because then it's weak. And I have an issue with that. Um, I think we need to give people more agency and let them, you know, decide how they want to express their gender. Um, I'm Taylor Rodriguez. I believe that I'm a feminist because I think it's wrong to be discriminatory towards people just based on their sexual, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, being a man or a woman, and like who you love in the world. That sh should not be based solely on those facts. It should be based on who you are as a person. And I think that femin um, being a feminist isn't just about fighting for equality for women, but it's fighting equality for everyone, yeah. and that um, a lot of people don't see it that way. Uh, hi, my name is Mariana Valdez, and I'm a feminist because I think a lot of people in this day and age forget that there's still a lot that needs to be done. Yeah. People could say, like, well, this isn't the 1950s anymore. We don't have issues, but we do, and the problem is they maybe aren't as discussed anymore, which makes it even harder to fight something if people think it's not relevant. Right. So I really think that we still need to be having these discussions, and if we don't have the discussion, then there's not really any chance of improvement. So this is really like the first step is talking about it. Thank you, Feminists United, and thank you, Dr. J. Dell, for your amazing talk. Thank you, audience. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for coming. Small but fun. And there is a lot of work still to do, unfortunately. Um, there's just, like, women aren't paid. I mean, there's so, I could have gone on for hours, right? Like, um, we just still have so much legislation to work on, so much societal stuff to change. So we're not done, and we really do need a fourth wave of feminism to carry on the struggle, right? We got to keep fighting, because we can't be complacent about discrimination and pay and discrimination and marriage and all kinds of you know, discriminatory actions. They're just not, they're not good for the economy, they're not good for people, they're not good at all. So I think it's important to carry that on and I'm so proud of these guys. I think it's awesome that, that they're doing it. Thank you guys for coming. I know we were small, but we were active and engaged and I hope y'all had a good day. 